Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I thought I'd give you a little update on some of the experimenting I've been doing indoors and some testing finally outdoors with this street star problem that I spoke about in the last video. Let's get started. As you may recall from the last video, I was getting these streaked stars after having made the conversion of removing the focal reducer and going back to the native focal link for the SCT. And I couldn't figure out where these things were coming from. Now, this is the first time I'm using the ASI 294 with this telescope at its native focal length. But I had just been performing imaging with this telescope and this camera, but using the focal reducer, and the stars looked fine in that case. So I couldn't figure out what was going on. I thought the worst. I thought perhaps I had a primary mirror tilt issue, something inside the OTA that would be very expensive and impossible for me to fix. It was also possible that having made the transition from the focal reducer to the native focal length, that maybe I didn't tighten down all the screws on the off-axis guider, for example, and that could have introduced some tilt. Perhaps that was the problem. And a lot of you had comments to that last video that you might want to check the fan vibration. It turns out that's been a problem for a lot of people. There are a lot of other issues that I had ruled out, mount issues, collimation, etc. It seems like the problem had to be something optical within the tube, the imaging train, or perhaps this fan vibration problem. But with all the comments I had on fan vibration causing stretched stars, I thought it'd be a good idea to go ahead and take a look at this. I do vibration analysis for a living, so I've got some accelerometers that I can use to make some measurements. And in this case, I've got these small accelerometers from PCB, the 333B52 accelerometers that I can simply attach via beeswax onto the back of the camera and record vibration. The cable that you see here is coming off going to what's called a data acquisition module that in turn is plugged into a laptop that controls the whole session. So I'm just going to sit and record vibration of the fan as I go through the process of turning the fan on and starting the cooling and bringing the cooling back down. And here's the vibration that I saw. It's actually quite high. I'm getting like a 20 millig vibration and amplitude of 20 millig peak to peak of about 40 some odd millig, which is actually fairly high. But you can see that when the fan is not running, the vibration is low. The fan comes on when you apply power to it. And then when you hook up Nina, it goes off again. Vibration is low until you start the cooler and the vibration comes back up. This view of the vibration data is called the time domain. And it lets us see what the overall amplitude of the vibration is, but it doesn't give us much more information. There's still more that we can get out of this. And if you go over to what's called the time frequency spectrogram, what you're doing here is taking, for example, in 10 second increments, you take it, that data, analyze it, convert it into the frequency domain, and then lay it down in this plot, building it up line by line by coloring the vibration level at each frequency with a color. In this case, the low vibration is kind of the blue, deep blue, green color. And as you get higher in vibration, the it goes into a green to a finally to a yellow when you get out to the high vibration. Now on the bottom axis you have the frequencies and on the side axis over here you've got time. So time zero is when I started recording vibration and an hour later I stopped recording vibration at 3600 seconds. Now right in here is where I applied power to the camera and then the fan comes on. So that's what you see here. The fan is ramping up to its speed to its operating speed here, but then I attach the camera to Nina and the fan turns off because the cooler isn't by default running when Nina comes up. Now, when I manually start the cooling process, the fan comes back on, again, it ramps back up and then it continues operating at its speed of 95 hertz, meaning that fan is circling at 95 times a second. But I'm getting a surprisingly high vibration amplitude of 21 millijes at 95 hertz. Now the question is, how much force can this little fan produce? Because it's got to be a force generated by the fan. It's causing motion of the camera so that it tilts by the required 4.1 arc seconds. Rotating impeller will have some degree of mass imbalance. In other words, the center of mass of the impeller is offset from the axis of rotation by some small amount. And when you have that, and as the impeller rotates, there'll be a constant force amplitude, but that force is just going to circle around the axis of rotation 95 times a second. The force of a rotating body is given by this formula here, where we can take 2 pi times the frequency of the fan. That's the rotation rate plug that in here, you square it, so it's a pretty big effect. And then you need to multiply that times the offset of the center of mass of the impeller relative to the center of rotation. Now, I don't know what that is, but just guessing, I'm 
guessing it's on the order of 0.1 millimeters or less. And the mass of the impeller, I'm guessing to be around seven grams. I took the fan and just the fan and put it on a kitchen scale and it measured out at 14 grams. So I'm assuming that the mass of the impeller is about half of that, maybe a little bit less than that. But anyway, just using these as rough numbers, I can plug those into this formula and come up with a fan force of 0.25 newtons or 0.06 pounds for those of us using imperial units. And that force circles the fan 95 times a second. Can that level of force, 0.25 newtons, actually cause the camera to rotate? This is a cartoon of my OTA and setup. You've got the SCT, of course. You've got an adapter, a stack of adapters to give me the back focus of 139 millimeters. Then, of course, you've got the camera on the end of those adapters. And then the force that we're talking about, the fan force, is applied back where the fan is. Now, the force is not just a steady force pointed in one direction. It actually rotates around 95 times a second. So half the time the force is pushing down and half the time the force is pushing up. One of the ways you can have camera rotation is if the whole body rotates, which would happen if you had some flexibility in the mount. And in this case, the OTA and the camera would rotate as a unit, a rigid unit, and you would get some rotation that way. The other way is to have some bending of this tube of adapters that I have here. And that would also cause the camera to move up and down, but also to rotate at the end of this adapter tube as it bends upward and downward under the action of the fan. And then finally, there's the opportunity for some local flexing with inside the camera itself where the camera sensor could tilt because of local flexure inside the camera body. A couple of these I can kind of rule out. The localized flexing inside the camera doesn't seem likely since I'm seeing the stretch stars in my off-axis guider as well as in the imaging camera. So if it were just localized flexing and bending or the imaging sensor inside the camera, that would be seen on the imaging sensor but not in the off-axis guider. The other two sources, the bending of the adapter tube and rigid body rotation of the whole system about the mount that would show up as stretch stars in the view of the off-axis guider. So those two seem most likely. I did go through some numbers, some back of the envelope numbers with the overall OTA, but there's just too much inertia for the small fan force to actually cause enough rotation of the overall OTA in a rigid body mode about the mount. But I did conclude that bending of the adapter tube is the most likely source of the camera rotation. And here I've done some, uh, again, back of the envelope messing around and came up with a formula for the resonance frequency of the adapter tube. It comes in at around 300 hertz or higher, which means it's not the same frequency as the fan force. If this number were around 100 hertz, then what you might conclude is that the fan was actually driving this adapter bending mode into resonant motion, and that would be pretty darn bad. That would be about 10 to 20 times higher than what I'm getting right now. Having a resonance frequency of the adapter tube much higher than the rotation rate of the fan means we're probably not dealing with a resonance problem, which means for all intents and purposes, this is a quasi-static response, and we can calculate the angle of rotation of the imaging sensor from this formula, which gives me, using the assumptions and all the parameters I plugged in, 0.1 arc seconds as compared to the 4.1 arc seconds that I'm actually looking for. Now, you might look at that and say, well, that doesn't seem likely that the camera rotation could have been caused by this small fan force. But wait, I can also use these calculations to predict what the vibration amplitude would be back here at the back of the camera where I had that accelerometer. And when I do that calculation, I find that it tells me the acceleration is only one millig. So that means I measured 20. This analysis is only telling me I got one. So I should multiply this number here to compensate for some of the assumptions I made in the analysis back up to 20 so that it matches the acceleration, matches the acceleration that I measured. When I do that, now I'm in the ballpark. Now the range of sensor rotation is on the order of 2.1 arc seconds, and I'm very close now to the 4.1 that I'm actually seeing in those stretched star photographs from a number of days ago. I wouldn't have guessed this at the outset, but it's very plausible, it turns out, that the vibration produced by the fan could in fact produce the streaked stars that I'm seeing in those images. Now I also have an ASI 294, has the same model fan, so I took my 
MC off the back of the telescope and put the MM on the telescope and repeated the same vibration test. So what I'm plotting here is the cumulative overall vibration. And what this is telling us is before you get to 95 hertz, the expend rate of the fan, there's essentially no vibration at all to speak of. But once you get to 95 hertz, the vast majority of the vibration that I measured is coming in right at the spin rate of the fan. And in this case, I'm measuring the 15 millijis RMS for the 294MC, but only 3 to 4 millijis RMS for the MM. That's telling us that we have quite a bit of variability in these fans. But this test clearly shows that the ASI 294MC fan is producing about five times more vibration than the ASI 294MM fan is. The best way to reduce the amount of force transmitted from a body that's producing the force to a body where you don't want the force is to insert a vibration isolation system in between. And that's what we have here in cartoon form. We have the fan, which is producing the force that we calculated as 0.25 newtons at 95 hertz. And we have our isolators here, which is just some combination of stiffness and energy dissipation or damping. And then we have our camera or OTA down here. So what we want to try to do is reduce the magnitude of the force produced by the fan that actually reaches the camera. And the curves you sh I show up here are two examples of force transmissibility curves. And what we're seeing here, for example, with the blue curve, we've got a resonance frequency of 17 hertz. And by the time you get out to 100 hertz, the 10% damping in this, this idealized isolator reduces the vibration by a factor of 20. On the other hand, if your isolator has too much damping in it, the same resonance frequency, but now with seven times more damping, I'm only getting a reduction in the vibration by a factor of four. Now, what does this isolation system look like in our case? There are these Noctua fan vibration isolators that are on the web. I got these from Amazon. It's 16 come in a box for $10, not bad at all. And you can install them as I show here. Now, this is an early installation I was trying out. What you want to try to do is make sure this gap is as big as you can make it. The problem is, and this may be a particular problem with the ASI 294s versus, say, the ASI 2600, there is very little room here to create a gap. There's about 17 millimeters back behind this plate before you run into the camera elements behind. And in fact, I could not install this piece as shown here. I had to actually push the fan much closer to the back camera plate, which in turn reduces the amount of isolation that I can possibly get out of this. For vibration isolation, we want low stiffness in this interface and we want low damping. Too much damping will undercut our ability to reduce the force transmitted to the camera. My vibration mitigation plan was to install a new fan that I got from Agena Astro for $18 and install these Noctua isolators as well, trying to provide at least some vibration isolation. And as you can see, this piece that I did finally get to fit, the fan is very close to the back end of the camera, so I'm not getting a whole lot of flexibility out of these isolators. Obviously, I cut off the exposed portion of the isolators here. Now, here's the results I got when I repeated the vibration test, but this time with the new fan and these isolators installed. We have the vibration I was getting from the original fan in the ASI 294MC. The gold curve is again the ASI 294 with its fan. And then now the ASI 294MC with the new fan and these Noctua isolators are back down here almost precisely where the ASI 294 is. So in fact, I don't think I'm getting much of a benefit with those isolators. The new fan is likely the biggest improvement and for all intents and purposes, it brought me down to the vibration levels that I was measuring with the ASI 294. So how did this look when I went back outside? So the image on the left is the shriek stars that I was getting. And on the right, we have the stars that I'm getting with the fan turned off. But now I've got the ASI 294 with the new fan installed and with the isolators installed. And now I'm back to getting ground stars, but of course the fan's off. What happens when you turn on the fan? Well, first of all, you hold your breath, hoping that you're going to see something good. And this is what I got. So, yeah, it looks like as I go back to fan off and fan on, the stars are basically unchanged when the fan comes on. So that's a huge relief. It looks like I don't have an actual problem inside the OTA. And my fan off stars and fan on stars look almost identical. So I'm back in the SET business now. What if you wanted to try to improve the vibration isolation performance of these Noctua isolators. Right now, I don't think I'm getting much of any benefit out of them. They're certainly not hurting anything, but I'm also not getting much of any benefit. 
and think if I were to do this again, or if I felt I still had streaked stars, I would do these two things. First thing I would do is install the fan so that it uses up most, maybe with a millimeter to spare, of the room back behind the camera plate, which if I have 17 millimeters back there, then I would want to take this to uh, 16 millimeters from the front end of the fan here to the back of the camera plate. And then I would slice off the remainder here so that these aren't contacting the heat radiation fins in the back of the camera. And that would give me a little more isolation capability because I would have more of a gap here. But that is probably not going to be a significant improvement. If you want to make a significant improvement, you can try this approach. Cut through three of the four isolators so that it's free to move and free to rotate about this last isolator. I highly recommend if you take this advice that you plug the fan in like this while holding the back of the camera and then run the fan to see what it does. If the fan isn't moving significantly, then turn off the fan and then close up the camera and you'll be good to go. Allowing the fan to twist about that one isolator will likely give you much better vibration isolation performance. Based on my results, I don't have to do this, but some of you with a longer focal length systems and a similar fan vibration problem, you might have to go to more extraordinary means to prevent that fan force from being transmitted into the OTA. First of all, thank you guys for your many suggestions and comments on that last video. I think it gave me some things to think about. I would not have thought about the fan vibration problem, but it's good that many of you commented on that and it gave me enough reason to go back and take a close look at that. It's always a good idea to challenge your own assumptions and I think that was very worthwhile in this case. I did the back of the envelope calculations on the vibration and it turns out, yeah, it's actually possible for fan vibration to cause enough camera sensor rotation so that the stars will appear streaked for a high focal length telescope. And in fact, I found that the most sensitive area of the OTA is that string of adapters that you have going from the back of the telescope to the camera, and that that acts as a beam, kind of flexes up and down when the camera uh, fan is running, and that fan can produce enough force and enough bending so that you will get those streak stars. I was really surprised to learn that that stupid fan is spinning at 5,700 RPM. Good Lord, that's fast. If we could get by with a fan that spins at only 2,000 RPM, the force generated by the fan would drop by 85%, and then nobody would have any problems with the fan. Based on my measurements of a couple of fans, there is quite a bit of variation from fan to fan. My ASI 294MC, the original fan in that camera, produces five times the vibration of the fan that's in my 294MM. I'm not that happy with the silicone isolators. I don't think they're doing much at all, given the small amount of space that you have back behind that camera plate. Now, if you like to live dangerously, it may be possible to dramatically improve the isolator performance by cutting through three out of the four isolators. And that way you'll allow more motion, freer motion, and you'll get something more like vibration isolation. Well guys, thanks for your suggestions. It looks like indeed I am a victim of the dreaded ZWO fan vibration problem. This testing that I've done here sure does show there's a lot of variability from fan to fan, and that's one of the big problems here, as is the fact that they spin way too fast. Okay, guys, well, that's all I've got for today. I appreciate you watching a week ago, and I appreciate you watching this one. I'll check in with you later. Clear skies.